Five Nights at Freddy's is a franchise that needs no introduction. It's long transcended being a video game and entered the timeless pantheon of internet meta. It's almost as if FNAF is now the common property of all online communities. So much so that many projects blew up despite being entirely derivative of the FNAF IP. No matter how ridiculous or meme status it becomes, it's just the grift that keeps on giving. And the community that sprang around it doesn't look any closer to disbanding than it did years ago, when it was at its peak popularity-wise. Even with Scott leaving the franchise and the game series ending on a sour note with the extremely buggy security breach, FNAF hasn't lost one bit of its appeal. But, as all things, there's a downside to this. Given that a significant fraction of the fan base is composed of children and preteens, a lot of the people interacting with the content and joining communities are not exactly capable of exercising proper judgment. All it takes is for a malicious person to introduce themselves with FNAF as the medium, and they can easily gain access to these vulnerable people and take advantage of their trust, concealing any and all kinds of terrible intentions behind a friendly veneer. This is magnified when the creep in question is a content creator, or in some kind of position of authority, as they'll naturally be approached online by people who enjoy what they do, and are likely to overlook their misdeeds. So these are the Five Nights at Freddy's Degenerates. <laughs> Although FNAF would initially have English speakers as its primary target audience, the popularity would quickly become international, as would the YouTubers that center their content around it. One of those many international FNAF aficionados is Matthias Vera Oyarzo, or as he would go online, Pollution Entertainment, creating his channel in September of 2014, when he was presumably 10 to 11 years old. He would upload many videos ranging from Let's Plays of various horror games to crude animations. Pero ¿por qué todos me llamo peluche, me, es que me puso un nombre al hacer, no soy un peluche, eso sería molesto. Sí, molesto para los peluches. Being a Chilean YouTuber, his channel would remain unheard of by the English-speaking community for many years, which probably contributed to less scrutiny overall. With his channel name meaning plushy in Spanish, he would start uploading sketches that use his collection of Disney and Teletubby plushies as characters to forward his plots. From an outside perspective, these videos seemed completely harmless, especially considering the fact that they consist of little more than some kid recording himself playing with toys. It's totally innocent. But with the context of what we are going to soon discuss, you could see glimpses of behavior that would parallel some of their later actions, with the sketches increasing in their levels of violence as time went on. Though it would seem far-fetched to imply that these scenes he would have the plushies act out indicated his personal interests, this would soon be proven to be the case. Around a year into Matthias creating content, a shift in the tone of the content became noticeable. He decided to make his persona a crudely drawn and cut out photo of SCP-173, the main antagonist of an indie horror game that went viral in the early 2010s called SCP Containment Breach. I know we've grown accustomed to having kids be familiar with things they're not supposed to, such as grim horror games, but allow me to point out the obvious. SCP can be seriously disturbing and should not be something super young people are exposed to. Regardless of that, Matthias would post videos of himself playing it on his channel. <laughs> Later on, he changed it into some weird mix of the SCP monster and Bonnie from the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise. Is it just me, or is everyone with drawn avatars with this animation style and color scheme some kind of severely demented creep? Anyway, he stuck with this profile picture and would continue to record Let's Plays of horror games, eventually covering the Five Nights at Freddy's series in its entirety. In his old backlog, you can see that FNAF became his primary interest to the point that he slowly abandoned the plush content completely so he could focus on playing not only the original games themselves, but also any fan games he could find such as Five Nights at the Chum Bucket, and very ironically, One Night at Flumpties, which will come up again later. After three years of making content, the Pollution Entertainment channel would hit some moderate milestones, as his channel would eventually surge up to over 12 million views. However, it was also around this time that a lot of red flags would start appearing in his uploads. In one instance, he would admit to his audience that he frequently watched and laughed at gore videos which, even if done for the purpose of just being edgy, will certainly screw you up. Matthias would also become more and more socially dysfunctional, which would manifest as him intentionally getting into conflict with other creators for no reason other than to stir up pointless drama. This would eventually result in strikes to his channel, as his videos would technically qualify as cyberbullying and harassment to YouTube. Eventually, though, this strange and negative behavior would take a turn for the far worse. 
Matthias would upload a short clip of his cat, Jason Kruger. The video itself doesn't depict much, other than the kitten swinging its paw at the camera and then licking itself. Though this was out of place, it was a welcome break from the negativity. Meanwhile, over the course of months, Matthias' toxicity would ramp up until an incredibly alarming video would go up in November of 2018. In it, Matthias was seen shoving a can of cat food aggressively onto his cat's face. Whatever backlash Matthias had been receiving up until this point would pale in comparison to the negative reaction this video would get, for obvious reasons. Although the video is now deleted, he would take to the comment section to address the people accusing him of animal abuse. His translated, pinned comment read, Seriously, there are assholes who are saying that this is animal abuse? What a sh exaggeration, ha 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 ha. I don't know what is going through their minds to consider this animal abuse. This was a sign that Matthias was intent on doubling down on his behavior, which unfortunately concluded in him eventually recording and posting a video of himself inflicting fatal abuse on Jason. In it, he would throw, stomp, and repeatedly hit his cat with a wooden spoon until he stopped moving. Matthias later confirmed Jason had died from the damage done in the video. In probably the most stupid attempt at deception of all time, Matthias would try to claim that the cat had died of natural causes on his channel, which everyone knew not to be the case as the video would become widespread in online forums in the following days. This would end up leading to the docs of Matthias, as people on the internet wanted to exact revenge on Jason's behalf. A hashtag called Justice for Jason began being disseminated, and a few change.org pages were created to stop Matthias. Unfortunately, Jason would not be the only animal victimized by Matthias. Just 10 days after the killing, Matthias would adopt two new kittens and proceeded to do the same thing to them as he'd done to Jason. On one particularly gruesome occasion, he would record himself dropping the kitten in a used toilet and watch as it tried to escape. After the story went viral as a way to spread awareness of Matthias' heinous actions, several English-speaking creators would come out exposing the situation to a much larger audience. The intentions ranged anywhere from trying to get his YouTube account terminated to having him arrested in real life for animal cruelty. Matthias would go on to show very little remorse for his actions and now deleted tweets, saying, I don't know who's been telling you that I regret what I did or that I feel bad about my cat dying. To me, it's worth nothing. Just the novelty of the day, and that's it. Besides, I haven't done anything to it, and I regret absolutely nothing. Thankfully, as the attention piled on to what Matthias was doing, an acquaintance of his would act in order to save the cats, posting a picture of them to Facebook with the message, Well, the pups are away from Matthias. As the only person that knew where they were, I went to fetch them and right now they are under the care of my family, while we look for people who will give them an appropriate place. Soon, we'll speak to an animal rights advocate to promote their adoption. As far as action from the local civil authorities, on the other hand, things seem to be going a little slower. People online managed to contact the police, who released a statement on Matthias' case. We informed the prosecutor's office regarding these occurrences, which ordered certain procedures that included an investigative process, such as putting together witness reports to establish the identity of this minor, his parents, and how the events occurred. The prosecutor on duty instructed us at the time not to take a statement from the minor. As these events transpired, the many accounts run by pollution would all become mysteriously inactive, prompting a multitude of rumors about what happened to Matthias. Then, in May 2019, he would take to his YouTube community page to make a very long post to clarify what was going on. I am not hospitalized. The reason why I have not been online and why I haven't uploaded videos is because I am forbidden from going on the internet. But when I can, I am going to upload a video and I will tell you what really happened to me. Because there have only been rumors. Yes, I was hospitalized, but for two weeks. I got out quickly for good behavior and because the psychiatric hospital was full. But the reason I went in was because of my parents so that I could be calmer. It is true that I'm on medication, but it's not anything crazy. Just things to keep me calm and that's it. They never took the cats from me. When everything happened, my mom decided to give the cats to a former friend because since my mom presumed we'd get in trouble with animal protectors, she decided to give them away. I have never been arrested. I will be going to trial, however. It is obvious that I will not go to jail, but I do not know what they'll do to me. I will find out two more months from now because the trials have been postponed. Some of you found out about the abuse I had at the, name censored, school, and it doesn't matter if I mention the school, because they already mentioned it in the newspapers. Also, do not trust any social network, because several of my social networks were hacked, such as Ask, and at first, Facebook and Twitter that closed it for me, so that they do not believe anything they have said by Ask or any other social network, because I currently can't access the internet. In this post, he makes reference to a certain abuse that took place in his school. 
But what is he talking about? In all of the controversy surrounding his animal abuse videos, none of it ever included something at a school. It was at this point that it became public knowledge that Matthias was being accused of sexual harassment. Besides an article that was published about it, and the court case which specified this as an offense, a now private YouTube video called My Final Verdict on Pollution Entertainment and audios from his colleagues would play an audio of Matthias masturbating while saying the name of one of his classmates. Supposedly, this audio was sent by Matthias to a friend of his through WhatsApp who then forwarded it to other people and so on and so forth until it reached the ears of the person whose name he was saying. In addition to this, if it wasn't bad enough, it seems he also groped two of his classmates on March 11th. He would eventually return to YouTube and continue posting, though obviously this did nothing to improve what people thought of him. On May 2nd, he would make an upload repenting for what he'd done and claiming he had only recorded that video of him hitting Jason with the can of food because he was trying to make him move as, according to Matthias, he wasn't able to. This was obviously another desperate attempt to save his image, which obviously doesn't explain the other abuse videos. Because his accounts hadn't been deleted, you could get the impression that nothing would come of this at all. A few months after this would-be apology, it would all change. I'm talking about there are YouTubers that film themselves murdering and torturing cats for their content. This first one I believe you've probably heard of a couple years ago because it was kind of big news. The channel's called Pollution Entertainment. I believe it was run by a 15-year-old Spanish-speaking YouTuber who filmed multiple videos where he was beating, kicking, pulling, throwing his cat against the wall until he eventually killed it. And it became kind of a big deal, at least in the Spanish-speaking YouTube community. In August of 2020, almost two years after the murder of Matthias' first cat, Moist Critical would bring attention to the story once more, highlighting the fact that, in the wake of the original story, several other Spanish-speaking channels began torturing and killing cats in the name of Matthias. In Latin American YouTube, these people were called the Cult of Peluchin. These copycats, namely Miriam Frenia and Atelos, would once again bring heaps of attention to the story of pollution, and just a month after Critical's video was uploaded, the majority of Matthias's many YouTube channels would get terminated. Although Matthias did make several court appearances around 2020 and after that, it seems he wasn't sentenced with any prison time as he would continue to ban evade on several channels that are still semi-active to this day. In November of 2021, it seems that his court proceedings reached some kind of conclusion, but Matthias himself would never comment on it explicitly to let people know what it was. It's most likely that he got a suspended sentence or probation. In the comments of his videos, he would occasionally reference it, but always keep it vague. His punishment should definitely be far more severe than what he got, but the least we can hope for is that he never does anything like that ever again. One of the most unique and important things about the FNAF franchise is this long list of fan games. Free creations built from the ground up by passionate developers that would either use the gameplay, characters, or general premise of what the first few Five Nights games would establish. Today, there are thousands of fan creations on Game Jolt alone, with many believing some of these fan creations to even exceed the quality of the source material. Unlike companies like Nintendo or Disney, who will take every opportunity to snipe out anybody using their IPs to make independent creations, or, dare I say, <coughs> profit off of it, Scott Cawthon was actually supportive of people using his game as the backdrop for their own creations. He not only allowed them to continue it, but decided that some even deserve direct endorsement and funding from him. The Fazbear Fanverse initiative was a project started by Scott to highlight the major talent of the community, with the developers consisting of Kane Carter, Fiznom, Nixon, Emil Mako, and Jonah Chrome, all known for their work on the fan games Pop Goes, FNAF, Open Source, The Joy of Creation, Five Nights at Candy's, and One Night at Flumpty's, respectively. On paper, the fanverse seemed like a really good idea, a way to reward passionate fans of these series to create their own installments in the IP with Scott's go-ahead. Honestly, has this ever even happened before? Some developers are so anal about their IPs, they'll get mad if you make a mod for their game. Meanwhile, Scott is letting people use original assets free of charge. Being greenlit had many perks, including being able to release and sell official merchandise under the initiative. For the first few years of the project, things seemed to be going in a great direction. But when you start to step back and remember the facts that the people being hired to work on these projects are just one-man teams who didn't possess the same professionalism and standards that Scott had, the foundations began to shift. Fortunately, many of the controversies would blow over of their own accord as months went by. However, one situation regarding one of the developers of the fanverse simply could not go without scrutiny and appropriate punishment. Further back, when Five Nights at Freddy's wasn't yet the household name it currently is, fan games were fewer and farther between. 
and consequently, it was much less likely for very talented and competent people to be working on them. This meant that, were a fan game to pop up that would even remotely match the quality of the official games, the project would erupt astronomically in popularity. The poster child of this phenomenon was the game One Night at Flumpty's, which would release in January of 2015. With the game meant to be a slightly humorous parody of the first FNAF game, lead developer Jonachrome did not expect the title to get even nearly the popularity it did. It was covered by a ton of big-name gaming channels, many of which were massive contributors to the fame of FNAF itself. Hello everybody, everybody. my, my name, name is Markiplier, Markiplier. Markiplier. Welcome, welcome to One, to one Night at Flumpty's. Flumpty's. Yeah! <laughs> Before Flumpty's, John had already accumulated a small following years prior, with him making a fairly popular series of Flash games on the site Newgrounds called Riddle School which began all the way back in 2006 and concluded in 2016. Although he would not reach the absolute heights of notoriety he did until Flumpty's, John already had years of experience with drawing and animating prior to it. I know it's possible some of the younger Zoomers watching this don't know what Newgrounds is, but it was basically the most popular game, and animation aggregator when using Adobe Flash was still a thing everyone did. John would keep his image clean in the fan community for years, releasing a sequel to Flumpty's a few months after the first, and promptly retiring the project after, stating he wasn't passionate enough to continue making games set in that world. I've made no secret of the conflicting feelings I've had about this goofy little series, but I know I'm not alone when I say it's a rough feeling when your most successful creation, or at least one of them, is something you didn't put your heart into. I made the first game in about three weeks to practice software I'd never used before. Not only was it a test parody game based on a series I really only had a passing interest in about five years ago, its cast is entirely made up of characters most people seem to have more passion about than I do. That was until he was approached to be a part of the fanverse in 2020, to make one last entry under the request of Scott himself. The game would release on Halloween of 2021 to fan acclaim, being the very first project to release under the fanverse label. All seems like it was going great, but the things that John had been doing unbeknownst to anyone for the previous six years would finally be revealed, and his image would be permanently scarred. On November 8th of 2021, just eight days after the release of Flumpty's 3, an anonymous Twitter user would come out with heavy allegations relating to Jonachrome. The message reads, Hello, my name is unimportant to this matter, and I'd rather stay anonymous. I love this community. I absolutely have been a part of the FNAF fandom ever since 2014. The point of this is to try and make it safer for everyone and minors. Don't go attacking Scott over this. He had absolutely no way of knowing who Jonachrome really is. I also strongly insist that minors should stay within their own age groups when meeting friends in the same fandom, online, whether artists or not. With that said, this is my testimony coming clean about Jonachrome. After seeing the release of ONAF3 and how Jonachrome has insisted on staying within the community and fanverse, I cannot stand by and allow him to continue being within this fandom, and I really should have come forward with this much earlier when I initially found out. I was involved with plenty of his group DMs from 2016 to 2018. A girl by the name of Emily was 13 to 14 at the time, and he came all out about his relationship with her within group DMs we've had. Jonachrome was already in his 20s. Charges cannot be pressed as Emily would need to do it herself, as she she would now be 19. I have evidence to provide for this with links to all of it, witness statements, and messages from Jonachrome himself. This man should not be praised at all, and I hope this helps people see him for what he really is, and why he should be removed altogether from any community he has a high stance in. We can gather from the witness accounts, which came from other people in their group chats, that John stated that he was definitely romantically involved, but that he would do nothing sexual with the girl until she was of legal age which some thought approximated the definition of grooming. However, these allegations from other people weren't half as damning as John's own messages, where he not only admitted to planning to marry Emily, who was still a minor at the time, but also mentions that they'd been dating for two and a half years. Considering her date of birth was set at 2002 on her accounts, this necessarily meant that they'd started dating when she was 14 at the very least. He was plainly aware that what he was doing was very wrong, because he was panicking over the net neutrality laws, which, if you don't recall, were a major point of contention back in 2017. His concern was that, he believed that somehow net neutrality being repealed would have some effect on his communication with Emily. 
His concern was also that, due to the obvious illegality of his relationship, if we can call it that, he'd either have to stop talking to her or get in trouble. It's quite obvious that if you need to justify being in a relationship with a minor in your 20s, with the counterclaim of it being romantic only, you know you were doing something you shouldn't be. The allegations would float in the internet ether for just a few hours until John would respond to the allegations himself confirming their credibility. His post said the following, I can't deny that these screenshots are real. When Emily and I met, dating wasn't even a consideration for obvious reasons. We were friends who got along really well. Emily and I share the same religious beliefs. We have a similar sense of humor. There's a lot of overlap in our interests and hobbies, and we could comfortably talk about a lot of things. We both felt like maybe we were meant to be together, and we were just born at the wrong times. We started talking, making it clear right away that there would be nothing special about our conversations, and that we wouldn't meet in person until she was at least 18. For a long Long time, I didn't see the harm in it. In a way, I thought I was saving her from experiencing the same heartbreak I did. This year, 2021, would have been the same year we met in person, with her at age 19. But this was also when I learned she was starting to have doubts about our relationship. She knew I didn't mean any harm, while also saying I'd effectively prevented her from exploring other romantic options by approaching her when I did. I'd like to say I knew better, but until that moment, I kinda didn't. The reality is, I didn't give her enough time to grow, and I shouldn't have even entertained the idea. It's a mistake I've made the one time, and I'll never make it again for as long as I live. For anyone who wishes to hear the victim side of the story, Emily and I are on good terms, and she is planning to make her own response to this as soon as she can. Regardless, I was wrong for pursuing a relationship with her. I can't change the past, but I hope that my story can at least serve as an example for others. This could have ended a lot worse. Stay safe. This brings us to Emily's thread on Twitter about it, which corroborated what John was saying. John Akrom was 100% responsible for his actions. He has apologized to me several times, and I truly still believe he is a good person. We even talk on good terms, even though we're separate. But he has recognized that he f***ed up. So please, as the victim, leave the man alone. Let me clarify, he has never tried to solicit anything from me. He has never asked me to do anything I didn't want to. It was not good to consider us having a romantic relationship when I was very explicitly not old enough. But keep in mind, we've always been friends. However, I will absolutely make note and admit his faults. Because he has mentioned s while I was a minor, he had thought about it, but nothing ever came of it. He didn't do what most who get caught up in cancel culture do. He has done nothing illegal, but yes, he was close. As an adult, I am not pressing any charges against Jonochrome, and I truly hope he is living his best life. He's been seeking therapy, and I do hope he'll make it out alive in this. On November 13th of 2021, John would make one final statement regarding the controversy, which is way too long for me to include here, but included him saying that he wasn't a groomer because grooming requires sexual intent, which he claims he never had. In the conclusion of his post, John stated he would leave the internet for a long time, with his Twitter bio stating he is now in therapy and seeking to be who he believes he truly is. It has been over a year since Jonochrome left the internet, and with everything laid out, it was probably the best choice he could have made regarding the subject. The aftermath of Jonochrome's exile from the community has been one that's very silent. The victim and the anonymous leaker have not been heard from since the situation. And although Scott hasn't made an official statement on what happened, the console ports of the game dubbed the Egg Collection were silently cancelled, and no words on any fanverse merchandise for Flumpties have been confirmed, as they were the only game excluded from having any official merch released for it as of now. This entire ordeal has made many question the concept of bringing figures from your fandom's community into the full. Since, despite Scott's best intentions, background checking strangers over the internet is a basically impossible task, and inevitably, you're gonna get at least one situation like this. Thankfully, the rest of the fanverse was seemingly not hindered by these circumstances, with the other creators continuing to post updates on their game's progress and still be on good terms with Scott. If there's one good thing about this story is that it's close-ended, and seemingly with the minimal amount of damages there could possibly be. Let's hope this case never has to be reopened, and John never reoffends. Justin Nicholas Cannonberg, also known as Blackout1912, or Nichi, was a fairly unknown creator in the FNAF fan games community. His biggest contribution for a while would be his work as the game designer and story director for a project called Insanity. His work was competent enough to attract the attention of other developers looking to recruit or work together. In early 2015, Blackout would begin to work on the fan game Dormitabis. Although there were a lot of internal struggles going on with the game at the time, it was released to high praise, with many prominent figures in the FNAF community making videos about it, which further expanded its reach. At the time, many would even tout it as the best FNAF fan game so far. However, this hype steadily declined as the years went by, as Blackout's online behavior would continually throw dirt on his work until it was completely buried. In every circle he was in, he managed to get himself into controversy of some sort. 
One of his most common offenses was being aggressive towards people he disliked in the communities he was a part of, which got to the point of him sending harassment campaigns towards other developers. The issue got so out of hand that sometime in 2018, a collaborative exposed video was put together to spread information about Blackout. Although this exposed video seems to be lost as of now, screenshots of the bullet points for the document are still floating around today. Most of the things listed on the documents, though certainly not good, still fall within the realm of just being a normal person, such as cheating on his girlfriend, bullying people, and not respecting others' opinions. Definitely three things that would make you an outcast socially in some respects, but it's not that big of a deal, right? Some other items, though, are far darker than others. In the fetishes section, it claims that Blackout has fantasies involving rape, physical abuse to the point of grievous bodily harm, murder, and having sex with dead bodies. Even if this was somehow him just being edgy, it was an indication that there was something seriously wrong with Blackout. In the story of Dormitabis, which was authored by Blackout, one of the plot points was the main antagonist, Garvey, brutally raping and murdering a 15-year-old girl. Oh my god! This is most certainly beginning to be... fun. There's this hot 15-year-old that was part of the kid's friends group. Ah... <sighs> You know, it was fun. She screamed, screamed, but nobody heard her. It was so much fun. She's in one of the suits now. Just a little more time until Fred Bears is going down as well. But hey, I'll find my ways to catch her at the others. Besides the cringeworthy voice acting and the tasteless and tone-deaf introduction of a topic like that into a FNAF game of all things, this eventually culminated into a real-life event that surpassed anything Blackout had done up until that point. On November 12th of 2020, a fellow developer in the fan game community uploaded a video exposing sexual messages Blackout had exchanged with a 12-year-old over Discord. For obvious reasons, the identities of everyone except Blackout himself will be concealed. In the multiple screenshots that were leaked from his conversations with his victim, he showed himself to be aware that what he was doing was taboo, considered himself her special friend, and referenced that Germany's age of consent laws were relaxed. It seems pretty obvious what the context of these conversations was. Blackout, being born in 2001, was 18 at the time these messages were being exchanged. This alone is already bad, but the messages got far worse, as it has been shown that Blackout had already sent a nude image of his bare ass to the same 12-year-old. This, ironically, can be verified by someone who had tried to defend Blackout as they tried to bring up Germany's age of consent laws as a way to justify this behavior. Even if appealing to the law was a remotely reasonable defense, the age of consent in Germany is still not 12 years old. Ever since this event, things regarding Blackout have been silent, as he left the internet and is not active anywhere currently that we're aware of. Their Game Jolt page shows Blackout's last message. Jesus Christ, just leave me be. I don't want to live in your heads rent-free. I've moved on, and you should as well. Bye. With what we've seen so far, it's safe to say Blackout has gotten off pretty easy. An individual with an extensive history of abusive behavior, who had inappropriate chats with a 12-year-old at the age of 18, got to quietly go offline with no significant punishment, not even a display of remorse or acknowledgement of what he'd done. Though it is likely and possible that he's still lurking under an alias, all we can do now is hope that they're away from the internet for good, or hope that they don't re-offend. Fortunately, the people who liked his mod decided to virtually separate it from his authorship by creating a remaster, so that new players won't end up unknowingly supporting Blackout and all the things he's done. Last, but certainly not least, in the name of inclusivity, I decided to add a female degenerate here as well. This person, of whom we have very few pieces of info as far as who they are in real life, was an active user on the Five Nights at Freddy's subreddit, becoming a micro-celebrity there for making drawings of Vanny from Security Breach, and, eventually, creating her own custom design of the character, which other users took a liking to. But no matter how small or niche a reputation can be, it's never so insignificant that a groomer won't go out of their way to decimate it. In January of 2021, former head moderator of the subreddit, FNAFGYFR would make a large post seemingly out of left field revealing that, when Mia wasn't posting FNAF fan art on Reddit, she was actually grooming minors on Discord. Can a sentence be more representative of online degeneracy than that? According to the former head mod, they received messages via mod email that had screenshots of the Discord conversations in question dating back to the middle of 2020, wherein Mia was saying explicitly sexual things to a minor, 
Though the names of the victims have been redacted for their own safety, the mods affirmed that there were multiple people coming forward with information about Mia simultaneously. In a very incriminating reaction to being asked about the grooming messages by the mod via an account with a different handle, Mia would reply in an almost cartoonishly self-incriminating fashion, straight up saying that the messages were still in her chat logs, without even noticing that she was indirectly admitting that the allegations were also true. Mia would then claim that, back in July 2020, she had given two people she knew in real life access to her account in exchange for money, agreeing to let them pretend to be her and even imitate her writing style to trick others. It's not exactly explained why these two supposed imposters would want to pretend to be her in the first place, but considering how hard it must be to make up lies on the spot, she probably didn't give it much thought. If Mia is to be believed, it follows that the grooming interactions were done not by her, but by one of these two anonymous people she's no longer in contact with. The only issue with this is that she herself said that she changed her password and stopped letting other people use her account in the same month, July of 2020. The teeny tiny problem is that, unbeknownst to Mia, the victims were still providing the mods with screenshots of their interactions with her, including ones that happened after July. While this was being cleared up by the victims that came forward, Mia posted to Reddit claiming that she would go to her best friend to find out who was responsible for the grooming messages. Conveniently, just five minutes after this post, an alt account would pop up on the thread, gloating about their successful character assassination campaign on Mia, to which she would innocently reply, Wait, what? Did you do that? Just a brief investigation of this alt account reveals that they posted NSFW art that was identical to some of Mia's illustrations. A writing style, perhaps you could emulate, but drawing exactly like her as well? While Mia scrambled desperately for a story to tie up the loose ends she'd left behind, she'd alternate between saying that she knew the people using her account in real life, and claiming that they were random anonymous people online she only interacted with through PayPal. But once again, her complete lack of self-awareness would destroy any narrative she was trying to weave. She'd eventually admit that the messages were real, and hers, but that it wasn't her fault because the miner initiated it. You heard that right. Regardless of this though, she also claimed that she kept on talking to them and engaging in sexual role plays, mind you, while slowly stopping her communications as opposed to just cutting it off cold turkey. Eventually, she still couldn't deduce that the mods were getting information firsthand from the victims who were showing that, even after the victims straight up blocked Mia, she would still try to contact them via the Reddit chat. Since she was blatantly lying about not being a groomer, her account was banned from the subreddit, and just a little while after, she deleted it. We shouldn't take this as a sign of remorse though, because her last post typically consisted of things such as, Stop, I can't do this anymore, I never lied. I tried to show the truth, but now the world is against me. This is not fair. The subreddit also discovered that, a while after the ban, another user by the name of Nessa Plush, who posted little other than NSFW Vanny art, was actually Mia trying to creep back into the community. Fortunately, she was banned from the subreddit preemptively, in order to prevent any more grooming from taking place. No fandom is immune to degenerate creeps and mentally ill people. As a matter of fact, the more a given community is geared towards children, the more likely we'll end up fostering these types. Considering the sheer size of the FNAF community, I most definitely just touched on the tip of the iceberg here as far as the insane people in it. That being said, it's not everyone. It's not even close to like 5% of the community, maybe not even close to 1%. Most people in most fandoms are frankly, normal innocent people who come together around an interest. There's just a few bad apples. Hopefully, documenting this kind of thing has a beneficial effect and helps prevent it from happening again to other people. It's good to see how vigilant certain spaces became about protecting young people and going after predators and other abusers. Partly due to how insular and independent the FNAF community is, it hasn't had nearly as many scandals like these as you would expect. When one does pop up though, it's about as depraved as what we've been conditioned to expect. Then again, considering how closely knit adult FNAF fans and furries are, it was simply inevitable that some degenerates would pop up. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone. I've heard it a thousand times before, and it's just not that far.